Welcome to Be The Difference, stories of everyday people who are being the difference in the lives of others. Be The Difference is presented by Back to Back Ministries, who exist to be a voice for orphaned and vulnerable children around the world. And I'm Sammy Matthews, and I'm here with my co-host, Chris Cox. Hey, Sammy, we get to dive into a good one on this conversation. I'm excited for it. I am too. So what do our listeners need to know before we hear your conversation today? This conversation is with David Gaines, the CEO and Chief Visionary for La Terza Artisan Coffee Roastery. He's also the board chair for Social Enterprise Alliance. And in response to COVID, he is now the co-host for the Third Place podcast, which we encourage you as listeners to subscribe to. Has a lot of great conversations around some heavy topics that we've all experienced coming out of this pandemic. The greatest thing that I would say we want to talk about um, in preparation for listening to our conversation with David is his concept around seven keys that every organization interacts with. He's going to allude to this throughout the podcast. So listeners, I just want you to like key into these seven things. First, he says that every organization uh, is going to interact with the supply chain, then employees, customers, competitors, community, environment, and self. We're going to dig in with three of those seven. We wanted you to have an overview of all seven of those as you connect with David and his story. Yeah, David really has a different approach to how to be a for-profit business. For sure. What we're going to hear is how his business is guided by the principles of how we can love God and love others like ourselves. And it was really refreshing and challenging to hear. And um, I'm excited for our listeners to get to hear and learn from David today. As we dive into this one, I'm going to give the disclaimer to our audience that I love coffee. And my understanding of coffee and its importance in um, our community and society as a whole has grown over time through conversations with people like our guest today. And David, I'm just grateful that you would spend some time talking about uh something that in most of our homes is a staple, but also has some impact in communities and and at a different level. I'm really encouraged by the way La Terza has invested in the coffee community. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm just glad to be here. And yeah, the story of coffee is really deep. There's lots of nuance to it. There's lots of direct effects to it. It's so communal. Um, so we're going to have fun. Yeah. There was a time in your life that this trajectory hadn't started yet, right? Like there was a time before coffee, if I would even be so bold to say, there was a time you didn't believe you liked coffee. <laughs> what was life for David Don't like? Don't tell anybody. I heard this story though. <laughs> there was a time. No, it's true. It's true. So um, a friend of mine started La Terza. And, uh, you know, I, I, at the time, when I was in college, I went to Cincinnati Bible College. And when I was in college, I wanted to work in, in a missional driven church, um, but not have to depend on that organization for my income. So and it was kind of just a strange circum- uh, series of circumstances. I started a carpet cleaning business. What I really did was create my own job. So I was mm. good at it. And now, like, now my passion is around social enterprise, and, and we'll kind of get into that with this story of coffee. But, you know, now I look back and I can say that, yeah, we were very educational. I was a green carpet cleaning company. So a lot of social kind of impact pieces of the work that I was doing. But really what I did was create my own job. So I, I was successful. That's what I did seek out to do. I created a source of income so that I could be very um, active in this serving way. But um, the downside to that is I hit a ceiling pretty fast. Mm. Um, I couldn't grow the business beyond me. You know, I, I, I built the business just bootstrapped, right? I, it, yeah. I didn't start with lots of investment or anything like that. So it was difficult to grow beyond myself. Um, and I didn't want to walk away from the nonprofit space. So I just hit the ceiling. I couldn't keep going and grow the business without walking away from the nonprofit space. I couldn't do what I really wanted to do in the nonprofit space either. I couldn't keep going in that because, you know, I still needed to eat. So I, so for me, coffee, um, so it is true. 
uh, I, my friend said he was starting this coffee roasting business. I said, awesome. I don't like coffee. So have fun with that. Yeah. At that moment, he gave me what I didn't realize was a very good cup of coffee. And I had no idea there was such a difference as good coffee and then coffee. Mm. Um, and they're pretty dramatic. So it still holds true today. I don't like coffee, but really good coffee, that's that's my jam. So uh, for me, the coffee journey and then even getting involved with coffee, yeah. the transition was, you know, here is this for-profit business, but because coffee, uh, you know, the story of La Terza starting was about working with the farmer and, and, and that kind of thing um, and really making sure people were paid living wages, not just fair trade, but like true living wages. Yeah. There was this very strong social aspect to a for-profit business. So that's what brought me into the coffee story as a whole was I could move and do one job that had both that dual impact. Right. I could make money and I could have social impact. And the more we grew the for-profit side of the business, the deeper the social impact we could have. And so um, now, again, that's led me to um, really f- help other businesses become more social really took me on this journey of discovery of what social enterprise is. And um, even now, I, um, a month ago, I became the, the national chairperson for an organization called Social Enterprise Alliance. So um, that's kind of a new piece of the story. But how do we help for-profit businesses think a little bit more like the nonprofit? How do we help nonprofits be a little bit more sustainable and think more like for-profit in this beautiful middle space of the social enterprise is um, – you know, what I'm passionate about. And coffee is just a great avenue to kind of get that conversation started. Yeah, it seems like that even from the beginning phases of your journey professionally, Bible college student, carpet business, really, those two don't match up no. as far <laughs> as one that feeds another in learning and environment. But you had this innate part of yourself that, that wanted to create what Maybe we do put a terminology around social enterprise that is. Maybe you didn't have words to put on it Correct. then. And you found um, maybe even just a, a way to pioneer some conversations around that because social enterprise isn't really a clear thing yet. Um, it's something that is continuing to grow. How would you define it as to what those who are approaching a longing for social enterprise, what are we really trying to do? For me, the the definition really comes down to – the you know the great commandment mm. it's, it's love god love other people as you love yourself so a social enterprise to me is in business how do we love everyone that we touch mm. and so it just comes down to that or you know and if it's a um, an audience that doesn't have kind of the, a christian background it's it's more the golden rule like treat other people the way you want to be treated so mm. everybody we have a responsibility to treat everybody in that way, to love everybody that way. So this, as I began to work at La Terza, this really took shape. How do we, who are, who are all the people that we touch mm-hmm. and how do we love them? So our story began with the supply chain, um, but it's, it doesn't stop with coffee. Like, unfortunately today, coffee is a slave trade product. That's just the reality of it. Um, and it, that's why it matters to know where this is coming from, how is the source you know, what is the relationship with that farmer or with the importer? Um, but if we're anti-slavery in the way that we buy our products, then I can't just go buy whatever T-shirt to put our logo on, right? Mm-hmm. I have to apply the same principles. And it has to apply to the tea that we bring in and and every other supply, like even office supplies. Is there a way to bring those in that kind of has that same heartbeat? So supply chain is kind of the core of who we are, but yeah. that's not the only group of people that we touch. Like... It, it, how are we loving our team members? How are we loving our customers? Um, for us, you know, we want to try to bring the best quality product, um, but, you know, that requires paying a little bit more. Um, how are we impacting our competitors? You know, the world that I dream of is a world where there is no such thing as slave trade coffee anymore. Well, I can't do that. I just can't. Right. right. The only way to do it is with lots of competitors. So, uh, and that's the world I dream of. So how do we love our competitors? They're people too. They're trying to feed their family. That's a really hard one, but it's an extremely important uh, group of people to love in business. How are we impacting our community? Um, you know, like not everybody that lives in Lachlan buys La Terza coffee, but they're my neighbor. So what, mm. how am I um, thinking about proactively loving my neighbor? 
How are we impacting the environment, which is really being a global citizen. We're all sharing this place. And then finally, you know, I love that great commandment because we focus on love God, love others. But there's really a, that third commandment in there. How do we love ourselves, too, mm, which is hard. Agree, yeah. And for me, in my experience, is almost everyone I know that's in the nonprofit sector or the social enterprise sector, they're really good at loving other people. Mm. And so we applaud that for sure. But at some point, we've got to love ourselves, too. That's good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work my way backward if you're sure. okay with it. So first on that, on that question, how do you – care for yourself? What's your self-care right now? If that's really, you know, a high priority for you, what are some ways that that manifests itself for you on a regular basis? So with all of those things, I, I think the, the key is that it's a journey, mm-hmm. you know, because my, here my answer is I'm not doing it well right now. <laughs> my, I did not mean to call you yeah, out. Yeah, no, no, it's good. I don't care. Um, I think it's healthy to say it yeah. uh, and be truthful. Um, you know, and it's seasonal a little bit. Sure. Um, and it looks like, you know, uh, without going into details, we've, we've, we're at the peak of the mountain and it's smooth sailing is looking ahead. So uh, um, lots of self-care is coming. Yeah. But, um, yeah, all of those things are really hard, right? So, so I think it's important just to, like, lay them out. So here's these seven areas. What are we doing now? Mm-hmm. And it could be nothing. Okay, well, what's the first step? You know, I I know what I dream of what self-care looks like. So maybe that was the first step for me is even writing that down. Yeah, right. Okay, now what's the first step to get there? And, and realizing the whole thing's a journey. Um, you know, if you're not thinking about how to love your co- competitor, again, that one's really hard. Yeah. Okay, we'll just ask the question out loud. That's the first step of the journey. That's a really important step. Yeah, that's good. As we keep that that conversation going toward – these, these areas that you've just unveiled to us, even in the self-care conversation, you brought us back to that next step of like competitors. How have you seen some wins in the conversation around moving from, maybe maybe it's not collaborator as much, as, but competitor feels like it's lessened of the, you know, that double-edged sword that feels like we should work together, but we are trying to go after each other. Where have you seen some wins around moving from competition to either collaboration or community? Yeah, definitely can happen sometimes in collaboration. Um, I think, you know, every year for the last few years, we've done a Cincinnati Coffee Festival, and that's really helped shape the conversation around what's really cool about Cincinnati. Um, Cincinnati has a great coffee culture. Um and so that's when you maybe see all of that collaboration at its best and, and we can cheer each other on. You know, the reality is if we can keep pushing into this com- uh, competition part of the story, I think coffee, the opportunity that lays in front of us as an industry is we could be the ones that set the new global standard of what international trade looks like. Mm. What makes you think that? Well, coffee is, uh, well, it just got moved down, um, but it, it used to be the second highest traded commodity in the world um, based on dollars spent back and forth. It's now number three. Oil used to be number one. It's now number two. Any guesses on what the new number one is? The highest traded commodity in the world. Highest traded commodity in the world? I don't have a guess. So the answer is data. Eh, I was thinking digital. I just didn't, I didn't have, I had no word for it. So the, you know, the big data conversation. So data has really just taken over. Yeah. So the reason why I think coffee has this opportunity is because it is so high up on that list. Mm. Um, and honestly, so of the top 10, you know, that they include like corn, wheat, copper, iron, you know, there, there's, there's these uh, core elements. If you look at all of them, honestly, coffee is the only one that you invite in. Mm. Every other one you could live, you can't live without. We can't live without data today. We can't live without oil today. We can't live without these other things that are like base for food and metals and things like that. Um, And you can certainly argue that you can't live without coffee. Um, But the reality is we could. Right. Um, And so this is an invitation product. Um, And so because it's so highly consumed, I think the consumer – and because the consumer through all of these roasters that are telling the stories of the farmers is now much more aware – the consumer gets to drive how we treat people and the consumer becomes more aware of slowly over time learning where their coffee comes from. Mm-hmm. But then it's like we start to maybe ask better questions as a consumer. Uh, we become more informed. Well, where does my T-shirt come 
from? Where do, where do all these other products come from? And, you know, uh, one of my, I would say my favorite aspect of coffee is that it really just connects us all. Mm. So, there, so, you know, we'll talk about the third place in a minute. It, um, I want to bring that up, yeah. but just what the meaning behind La Terza. So there's this gathering that we have over the shared drink. But the hands that made that drink, there's hundreds of them that brought all this to that table. Yeah. And, and we just are so connected through this product. So I think that's an awareness. Um, as you dig in deeper, you start to realize like hundreds of people made this backpack and this computer. Yes. And you start to ask maybe different questions. Yeah, it's, it's humanizing the story of all of the neighbors that we need to love like ourselves, right? Totally. Yeah, I, I mean, everything that for me, this is all built on um, – the greatest commandment, which I brought yeah. up, and then also just Genesis 1. If we're mm. all made in the image of a creator, then what what is create work is creating things, right? right. So the whole fair trade conversation, mm -hmm. it is it's Genesis 1. It's it, to me, it's less about the money. It is more about the God-given identity that lives within someone else, mm. right? My favorite the first time I went to a coffee plantation, uh, and this is we have a, a primary direct trade farm that we work with in um, Honduras. So I went to the farm and th this was my first time there and I'm just seeing the whole process and how labor intensive it is and all the things. And there was uh, uh, one of the steps is you sort all the coffee. So you can give the most organic feed and best care of a plant. That plant's not going to produce 100% good coffee. You still have to pick the ripe cherries at the right time and then sort it all out. So maybe, I don't know, anywhere between 30 to 50% of that plant will be specialty grade, mm -hmm. which is what we are, are purchasing. But then the rest of the plant goes into more of a commodity grade or instant coffee format. Well, someone manually picks all that out. And so I'm at this, there's this table of women and there was this 80 year old woman ish picking coffee. And, you know, I'm just observing and she had the biggest smile on her face mm -hmm. and so much joy doing that job. And, you know, I was thankful that I knew that we were through the way we bought coffee and through this relationship, she was being paid a living wage and it was something that her family could use to be sustainable. But I walked away from that moment as just super pivotal, uh, as a super pivotal moment. She clearly was doing something that brought her joy. And the reason why we work so hard to bring out the best flavor of that particular coffee is for her. It, yeah, like her work yeah. matters. The reason why we try to get coffee fresh to our customer is her work. She's part of the chain, right? And, and I have to live into that God-given identity of a creator, right? She's yes. a creator and she's working and she's in the image of a creator. So it's everything that I speak, it's those two things. Genesis 1, love God, love others. I love that you just said uh, a little bit different of that Genesis 1 story than most of the time we speak. We speak about creator and we're the created, which then sometimes can, can cause us, I think, to treat each other more as resources, as created things. You identified in this woman that she is a creator as well. And you celebrated the image of God as creator in her, not as the response to the creator as created. I think that's powerful. Yeah. I think to that first piece that you were talking about of emphasis on loving one another equally through the supply chain, that's the thread that we're pulling on, right? Is that we have creators on the front lines that unless we humanize and have some story from or understand the construct around life, this is usually where we end up using terminologies around slave trade, around dehumanization, because we cut down the front line in order to keep the bottom line lower. Can you walk us through a little bit of that like history of what fair trade coffee should look like? Sure. Yeah, so well, the name La Terza is Italian. And that's kind of our way to say, hey, Italy, thanks for inventing espresso. We really like it. <laughs> but the, the actual translation is the third. And there's all these threes that show up. So again, like I, I bought La Terza a few years in, so um, I didn't name it. But the three highlights, coffee comes mainly from three different regions around the world. And they all kind of have their own unique flavor profiles based on geography and farming practices that are available 
on weather patterns and things like that. So you have Central and South America. Um, you have Africa, which is where coffee was discovered. And then you have Indonesia, Southeast Asia region, um, a lot of Pacific islands. So that's kind of the first set of three. For us, you know, as we built our brand, we were really keyed in on how do we have this relationship with the farmer? Yeah. Um, what does roasting in these small batches look like? Like not everything is uniform, but how do we really bring out the maximum flavor of that one specific coffee? And then how do we deliver the coffee fresh? So sourcing well, roasting in small batches, delivering coffee fresh were like kind of our three pillars. Mm. But really the thing that we've lived into now is how do we create, how do we help independent coffee shop owners uh, in their business? And, and really the heartbeat of that is something we call a third place. Yeah. But the, it gets its name because it's like this gathering place where we can come together and actually talk. And, and uh, you know, it, it gets its name because it's not your home, it's not your work, but here's this third space. So I think of it like a community living room. Mm. And, you know, now especially, like, our key is, like, how do we – we have a business course. Here's how to open a coffee shop. I want to see – thousands of coffee shops open around the country, but in a sustainable way, because nearly everyone that comes to us that wants to open a coffee shop, this idea of a community space is kind of the heartbeat. There's usually a love for coffee, although not always. They're asking the question, how do I, my community needs a place to come together? And and that com- that question is being asked now more than ever. One thing that just clicked for me is that you like you may like to win a little more than I thought because you mentioned that data had outpaced coffee a little bit, and yet now the third place is a podcast. So you're going to try <laughs> to win the data area as well as the coffee opportunity. Tell me about the third place becoming a podcast. Yeah, that's uh, that is kind of funny. I'm, <laughs> I am pretty competitive. Yeah. So okay, our heartbeat is how do we support community-minded businesses? How do we support third yeah. places? So last year in March, the world shut down very fast, right? And and what we're trying to do is, you know, yes, we, it, through coffee, but also through just business resources, how do we empower these independent owners? So we put together a series of um, webinars, just like you own this business. And the whole reason why you own this business and work so hard for opening a coffee shop is to create places where people can gather. And what we can't do right now is come gather. So, I mean, it like went to the core Mm -hmm. of people, right? So it was a webinar series. How do we like, how do we invest in, or, you know, how do we share best practices with pivoting that we're seeing across the country? How do we share best practices with, you know, the baristas were on the front line once we started to open up a little bit last year and masks became normal. You know, a lot of baristas had to, like, confront p- customers who like, no, I don't want to wear a mask. And, right. you know, there would be a scene. Well, the barista is someone who makes $10 an hour plus tips, and they're supposed to handle a customer and not get on YouTube for creating a scene, right? So how do we – how do I help you, coffee shop owner, train up your employees to talk about that? Um, and and it, it became this resource. So – we saw it maybe potentially launching as a podcast. We were talking mostly about business support in that idea of a community-minded business. And then kind of the tipping point was um, George, Florida, George Floyd. And when he was murdered, mm. you know, we had to talk about race and, and, and bring that into the coffee shop space. And, and how do you tackle that mm. problem? And, and again, being open and honest with that conversation the idea of not your home, not your work, but this community space. But in this digital format, it also was like, it's your perspective and here's my perspective. And then is the third place kind of this middle space, you know, and could we find more truth that is mm-hmm. in the middle? So um, so anyway, we started to talk more about theory and it's how do we bring very uncomfortable conversations, the conversations that we should be talking to, mm-hmm. uh, or the conversations that we should be talking about, how are we bringing those conversations into a comfortable place digitally. So that's called the third place podcast. Right. Because it's never for you been about creating a thing. It's always been about creating things that empower humanity toward equity and loving our neighbor as ourselves. So it would make complete sense that it goes from coffee to a podcast to teaching and training others to be in the same type of field or experience and giving away what you've learned. I, I love all of those things. David, I want to say thank you for thinking 
ahead of your time, our time, about what being together could look like from the frontline worker who is picking a coffee bean to the consumer who's going to walk into a coffee shop thinking, I came here just for a cup of coffee and I'm leaving with relationship. And I'm grateful for the way in which you're leading. I've learned so much even just from this conversation. So thank you for being you and for giving yourself away so so freely. Chris, as we wrap up that interview, what is still in my mind is a picture of a woman on a coffee plantation sorting through beans, engaged in her work, being a creator. Honestly, it was challenging to me because I don't think I've really taken a lot of time to stop and think about about where my cup of coffee comes from. Like I make it in the morning and I put it in my travel mug and I go and I, I'm not sure I've given a lot of thought to the hands that were involved in creating it. Yeah, I have a deeply intimate relationship with coffee. <laughs> we, we enjoy one another's company on a pretty regular basis. My relationship has been transformed over time, and I say I have a deep relationship with it because my grandmother gave me my first cup of coffee when I was six years old. Well, that's pretty young. <laughs> pretty young. <laughs> it had caffeine, too. I'm not sure what she was thinking. Uh, but So I love coffee. I love the memory of sharing coffee, kind of even this little, you know, you shouldn't be doing this ritual <laughs> that I had with a grandparent. My journey, though, has become even more intimate with the experience around coffee as I've learned from people like David who give a holistic perspective from where a coffee bean comes from, who has intrinsic value to pick Mm -hmm. that coffee bean and make it a piece of art, and what the taste is. So an experience with me around coffee will involve something like a pour-over experience where I'm going to sit with a friend. If I'm asking you to get coffee with me, it's going to be we're going to share this journey to really hold the authenticity of what this taste and experience is. So as David was talking, there was a lot of me that wanted to just be making a pour over with him. Oh, well, we should have done that. While we were conversing. And that understanding of who that is as the ethos of David was what really stood out to me. And as he continued just to really even drive the conversation, you could tell this is not something he does. This is something that he is. And that's what I really loved about the, the conversation. Well, yeah, it just... Like, like I said, I hadn't really thought about where my coffee comes from, but I also hadn't given a lot of thought to like the ritual experience of gathering and over a shared cup of coffee, that concept of a third place was new to me. I've never heard that in terms of like a coffee shop setting. And he's right, like a cup of coffee and that experience can be so much more than just grabbing it to go. Yeah, it deepened the understanding of an earlier podcast. If if you haven't listened to the conversation with Joey Taylor around the art of storytelling, mm. I encourage you to go back to that because his most powerful place of storytelling is around this program that they call Cuppa, which mm-hmm. is around this same idea of coffee and conversation and um, holding stories together. I think David just expanded that for us to the supply chain and then a conversation around employees, customers, competitors. I really thought that the tension you could hear in his voice around even the word competitor, that Mm -hmm. he sees collaboration, but yet at the same time he knows in a whole food store, like he wants you to choose La Terza because he knows what the brand is doing and what it says. So there is some competition, yet he wants us all to be able to make a choice as well. So it's like, I want you to make a choice, but I want you to choose something that goes toward this direction. Yeah, it, he really has like an expanded view, like the, mm. the seven seeds of all word. the areas of a business and expanding your view of not just the cup in front of you, but where it came from. And just expanding, he's helped expand my view of how a for-profit business can function kind of like a nonprofit and yeah. can have a a social, a positive social impact. It doesn't have to be this one or the other. Yeah, as soon as you said expanded view, I thought, and kingdom. His mm, He has an expanded yeah. kingdom view that mm-hmm. is really, really encouraging that we can be in a for-profit um, sp- 
like environment that's making a product and creating currency and investing in an economy and have a kingdom mindset, Mm -hmm. not only from the belief system that we have around it, but actually the way in which the product works. Like there's a kingdom approach to love God and love your neighbor as yourself from the supply chain all the way to myself. I love that. Yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, if someone's not the leader of a Mm. business or organization, if we really boil it down to what David kept coming back to was, how am I going to love God and love others? Like in my role at whatever company I work for, how am I going to love God and love others? But that view of others is all of those people that are part of the chain. And if is the recommendation like to you, to me, to everyone, like just pick one thing, like pick something that maybe you consume or use as a product. There are a lot of uh, social enterprises, as David would define them, mm-hmm. around food, uh, household goods, vehicles, clothing, shoes, things like coffee. Maybe our takeaway is to choose one item that we consume in, a, in abundance mm-hmm. within our daily experiences. For me, then the number one thing is coffee that I consume on a daily basis. Choose one thing that, that we bring in in abundance and ask the question, does this product that I'm consuming empower my relationship with God and my relationship with my neighbor in equity with God. Yeah, like are all all the people along the way being honored? Yeah, that's a great way to put it. How how are they being treated along the way? I think that's something I'm going to start asking about products that I use. And I'm really grateful to David for sharing his knowledge with us. It is obvious he has a teacher heart. That is part of what they do yes. is equip and empower other businesses to be social enterprises and to have a positive impact. So we're grateful to David. There are links in the show notes to La Terza, where you can get La Terza coffee, to the Third Place podcast if you want to hear David and his co-host dig into some of these harder conversations. As always, we're grateful to Cohatch Mason, to our incredible producer, Mikey, and we're grateful to you for joining us and listening along with us. For sure. In those show notes, we're going to make sure that there's a link to Sammy and mine because if you choose a link to La Terza Coffee and are going to pick up um, a cup of La Terza in one of the coffee shops that they supply, we would love the invitation to share a cup with you. Mm-hmm.